Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to another in SCAMP's series of webinar events. I'm Alan Greenlee, the Executive Director of SCAMP. And today's topic is a recent research done by the RAND Corporation's Center for Housing and Homelessness in Los Angeles on the effects of project labor agreements on affordable housing production. This is the 24th of our webinars this year, uh, and we've had uh, 2,500 or so folks uh, in attendance, so we're um, very happy to bring this additional uh, important information to, to our members. Our webinar, webinar series is, is part of our ongoing service to members, providing capacity building and informational sessions about current topics in the affordable housing field. And today, we've got a number of folks uh, together um, to talk about this issue. We'll start off with a presentation by Jason Ward from RAND, and we'll be talking about his recent study. Um, then we'll uh, transition to a panel discussion where Jason will continue uh, to be uh, part of the session. We'll also have Dave, Dave Egan from EAH Housing, Chris Hannon from the Los Angeles and Orange County Building and Construction Trades Council, and uh, the session will be moderated by uh, Joan Ling from UCLA and a uh, SCAMP board member. Um, after the panel discussion, we'll open for questions and answers from the audience and would just uh, direct audience members to the um, question, the Q&A function down at the bottom of your screen where you could submit your questions. Um, to learn a little bit more about the folks who are speaking today, first we have Jason Ward, the Associate Economist, Associate Director at the RAND Center for Housing and Homelessness in Los Angeles. He's also a professor at the Pardee RAND Graduate School. Dave Egan is the Vice President of Real Estate Development and Construction at EAH Housing. Chris Hannon is the newly appointed Executive Secretary of the Los Angeles Orange County Building Trades and Construction Council. Uh, Joan Lang is a lecturer in urban planning at UCLA Luskin School of Public Affairs and a SCAMP board member. She literally teaches the class on affordable housing. Um, our conversation today as I mentioned, it's really about the study. And the study has things to say about the current state of affordable housing development in the city of Los Angeles. City of Los Angeles. I think there's a lot that all of us can learn from the study's findings. And at SCAMP, we're eager to absorb and build on the findings of the study. And speaking personally, I'm encouraged by how much the study found. For example, despite the newness of the project labor agreement, which will no doubt be discussed in some detail today, 45% of the units proposed and that are being built on project uh, proposition Triple H are funded and using a project labor agreement to build them. So it, it demonstrates that uh, work with the building trades in the affordable housing industry is absolutely possible. And I think I'm encouraged by the increasing uptick in the use of the project labor agreement. And um, with that, I think we'll start to discuss the, the meat of the of the session today, and I'll turn the floor over to Jason Ward. Jason. Okay, thanks for having me, Alan. I'm really uh, excited to be able to present this to such a relevant audience. Um, and there's quite a bit for me to try to get through in a modest amount of time. So I'm just gonna try to share my screen here and jump right in. Uh, here we go, I think this is the right screen. Um, yeah, so this is a recently released report that I, kind of, I spent most of about the last eight or nine months working on. And um, in the course of uh, discussing the research, I'll also give you a little bit of background on how I sort of came to be interested in this uh, policy and studying it. Um, I'm just going to say a few brief things about HHH, since I assume people are generally pretty familiar with it. Um, as you all probably know, it's a $1.2 billion bond offering that was approved uh, by LA voters in a 2016 ballot initiative that was pitched as a way to spur the development of up to 10,000 units of housing for people experiencing homelessness in LA. Uh, at the present, five years later, a uh, few of these units are online. The costs have been dramatically higher than were pitched during the campaign for the uh, proposition. And the way the initiative has been implemented is, has received criticism from a city controller's report, from multiple city council members, from Judge Carter and others in the sort of a community of stakeholders and policymakers. Uh, despite all this focus, though, there's relatively little evidence on why the costs for HHH projects have been so much higher. 
Um, however, one notable difference between HHH and other funding sources used uh, for projects in the city's supported housing pipeline is the project labor agreement that's the focus of this study. I'm just going to give a basic sketch of some key aspects of project labor agreements. Uh, these, I'm going to speak specifically about uh, public works project labor agreements. So these are a pre-bid contract between a, a relevant funding authority and area trade unions. Key features of these agreements uh, worth noting are that they require virtually all hiring to be done through union halls, aside from a small number of non-union workers, which is typically a, a point of negotiation in uh, negotiating these agreements. These workers must usually be matched one-to-one -one with union workers. The agreement also specifies ratios of apprentices to journey level workers. It specifies no lockouts or strikes, and it has a, a number of enforceable arbitration and grievance procedures and other rules around work hours, pay, and benefits. Participation in these agreements is mandatory for any contractor union or not desiring to work on the associated project or projects. Most uh, public works PLAs now also include uh, what I think are generally called targeted hiring provisions, specifying goals for the utilization of local or disadvantaged workers. Though these are typically distinct from the, the enforceable provisions above and generally rely on good faith efforts from the relevant unions to meet these goals, which may be, for instance, that say 30% of uh, work hours performed by apprentices should be performed by residents of certain zip codes or with certain socioeconomic characteristics. Um, to give a bit of background on the specific HHH PLA, which is uh, important to this research, this PLA wasn't part of the ballot initiative passed by voters. It was added by the city council about a year and a half after the election. The motivation given by the council was to reinvest bond dollars into our local neighborhoods and residents by training them and employing them as often as possible on funded projects while maintaining the unit goal of Proposition HHH. Um, and an important, uh, one of the important things to note is that the PLA um, associated with HHH is, is quite a bit different than the PLAs associated with a lot of other um, entities. So for instance, uh, the PLA associated with the Los Angeles Unified School District uh, governing uh, capital projects for the district is more typical where say, if LAUSD is gonna build a new school, they're going to pick a location for that school, they're going to design a school, they're gonna to go to builders and put it out to bid and say, if you wanna build this, here are the plans, here's what it has to be like, uh, and you have to be a signatory to this PLA. Um, the unique feature of the HHH PLA is it doesn't apply to a set of pre-specified projects. Instead, it applies to any development seeking funding through HHH if the project proposed comprises 65 or more housing units. So this unique feature allowed the PLA uh, associated with HHH to have a significant impact on the portfolio of projects that were proposed. As well. I'm going to present evidence to that effect. Um, before I begin doing so, um, I wanted to say a few things about the setting for this research. I don't really have the time to um, review much about existing research on PLAs, but I'll just try to say briefly that uh, Existing research is uh, subject to a couple of uh, pretty valid criticisms. One is that uh, much of it focuses on large geographies, so say maybe collecting all the projects together in a state, like school building projects or something, and then looking at projects that had a PLA and comparing the cost of those projects to projects that didn't have a PLA. Now, this may be, say, a state like Massachusetts, and it may be the case that all the projects with the PLA are projects in Boston, so that, for instance, you know, there are lots of cost drivers in Boston that don't potentially have anything to do with the PLA. And this is going to be conflated with uh, an association with the PLA and costs. So uh, this is a common sort of an issue in existing research. Additionally, uh, a lot of the existing research may use, say, a decade or even maybe two decades of data where a lot of factors related to uh, labor supply, uh, building material costs, and other things that are really hard to adjust for are included and may confound this sort of estimate. So um, this research makes some progress on both of those fronts that I think is important to note. Uh, first, it uses a large number of supportive housing projects, which are all quite similar in terms of the nature of the projects that were proposed and built in the city of LA. 
Some were built with HHH funding and some were not. For this reason, all these projects are su subject to a large common set of regulations, barriers, and cost drivers. Uh, additionally, all the projects that I use in the cost analysis uh, use LIHTC funding, so they're subject to a, a number of common factors related to seeking funding from this source as well. Um, in terms of uh, the temporal dimension, all these projects were undertaken in a compressed time period uh, relative to a lot of past research. They all applied for LIHTC funding in about a five and a half year time span. Uh, and then just broadly, the data used in this project was collected from a number of data sources uh, that I'll just uh, let you read off there real quickly. But the primary cost estimate data I use comes from LIHTC uh, staff reports and applications and the primary uh, data on unit size and other things comes from HCID. So now I'm going to um, present some evidence on how the PLA appears to have affected the distribution of projects proposed under, under Proposition HHH in terms of size. And here I'll, I'll make a brief analogy um, about how I came to, or an anecdote rather, discussing how I came to be interested in this project. Um, what happened is as part of our uh, effort here at RAND to kick off this new center looking at policy issues related to housing and homelessness, we spoke with a lot of stakeholders and one of the people we spoke with was uh, an affordable housing developer that in the course of a pretty wide ranging conversation mentioned the PLA associated with HHH. And um, the fact that this developer was looking at having to sort of deal with, uh, you know, bringing a project in and working under the PLA. And I, you know, I just sort of said, what's that gonna be like? And the developer said, I have no idea. I've never done it before. So. Uh, when when this individual mentioned the unique threshold, that sort of set off economist alarm bells, or not, not just uh, it just it piques my interest because uh, a lot of policies with really specific thresholds tend to have really strong incentives potentially associated with them. So that um, discussion led me to go get the basic data from the city's uh, HHH pipeline website and develop this figure you see here. Um, what this is is a histogram that plots on the y-axis here, the number of projects uh, funded by HHH, and then on the x-axis here, increasing uh, size of projects as, uh, as measured by the number of housing units they contain. So each of these uh, ticks, say 35, is 35 to 39 units, 50 is 50 to 54 units, and so on. And then this dashed line here is the threshold at which the PLA applies to projects. So as you can see here, um, perhaps not surprisingly, there's a, a sort of a significant buildup in project size as you get into larger projects. Um, this is at least partially because HHH has some financial incentives to incentivize larger projects through uh, reduced interest rates based on project size. However, when you get here to the threshold for the PLA to cover projects, you'll see that there's this remarkably large number of projects in this very narrow band of 60 to 64 units. Um, I believe this exact number is 23 projects, which represents a, nearly a quarter of the total. And then when you look across the PLA threshold here, you see one project with 65 to 69 units. And it's not until you get out here into sort of the 95 to 104 unit range that you see even say five or six projects of, this, of, this, of these given sizes. And in fact, this entire group of projects between about 65 and 104 units is equal to the number of projects with exactly 60 to 64 units. And, about, and nearly half of this uh, group here has exactly 64 units. So this um, sort of led me to believe that there was something pretty significant going on with respect to the way developers were looking at the PLA and the way that they were uh, potentially shaping projects in order to not have them fall under the PLA. But in order to try to tease out whether, for instance, this might be related to other factors, say the fact that a building type might change discontinuously when you get around this range or something like that, um, a further analysis that was possible was to take the city's pipeline of projects that weren't funded by HHH, but that were part of the supportive housing pipeline the city maintains data on. And so what I did there is instead of uh, counting the number of projects here on the y-axis, now we're counting the percent or the share of total projects according to the funding type, HHH or, or non-HHH. And what you can see here is that, first off, as I mentioned before, there are many, many fewer very small projects funded by HHH. 
But when you look at this sort of uh, range significantly away from the PLA, and as a note, I've grouped these in now in not five unit groups, but 15 unit groups, because there are about 34 non HHH funded projects the city maintains data on. So it was necessary to group these into larger groups. However, the grouping scheme simply took the HHH, the PLA threshold as a point, and then I just moved along in 15 unit groups. So what you can see is in this relatively small bin, there's equal numbers of projects. And then if you go to this much larger bin, say 95 plus uh, sized projects, you'll see again that these are these are fairly comparable. And this, this uh, seems reasonable given that these kinds of projects are, are generally gonna be type one construction where for instance, uh, the kind of composition of a workforce vis-a-vis -vis, uh, unionization may not be so different from what would be required under a PLA. But it's this middle section where you see significant differences in these relative shares. Nearly 45% of the projects uh, in, in the HHH sample are between 50 and 64 units, while only 9% of the non-HHH sample is there. And then you see increasing numbers of larger projects in this non-HHH sample, while you see about 5 to 7% of projects funded by HHH falling in this range that's kind of just to the right of the PLA threshold. So taken together, these two points suggest that the PLA had a significant effect on the types of projects that were proposed and appears to have resulted in a disproportionate propensity to propose smaller projects, which is counter to the financial goals uh, sort of put into to HHH, and it's also counter to the city's motivation to not affect the unit goal of HHH. Um, I'll skip these takeaways since I kind of went through them. Um, the second component of this report, though, is estimating the cost effects of the PLA on projects that were covered by it. Uh, to do this, it's necessary. I'm, I'm going to have to skip a lot of detail, but I'm going to try to give a strong intuition for what I'm doing here. And uh, so it's necessary to first discuss briefly the notion of economies of scale, um, which many of you or most of you are probably familiar with. So at the risk of being pedantic, um, I'll just say that this idea relates to the fact that a project has many fixed or semi-fixed costs that don't linearly increase with project size, things like site prep, foundation work, size of a basic workforce, and many other factors. So that as the number of units increase, the per unit cost may often decrease. And to try to develop this intuition uh, with, with uh, a little bit of data, I'm going to just show you some descriptive evidence on costs in the same sorts of grouping, groupings excuse me, that I was looking at before. So here we have, uh, again, the sample of non-HHH funded and HHH funded projects. And what you can see here, again, in the middle is the difference between projects that are covered by the PLA and projects that aren't, 50 to 64 versus 65 to 94. And here I've just grouped smaller and larger units into sort of uh, one large category. So you can see here, if you look at the non-HHH funded projects, a really nice example of a sort of a linear looking relationship in terms of economies of scale, where you see these projects decline. They start at about $500,000 per unit for smaller projects. And by the time you get to 95 or more units, costs decline quite linearly by about 20% to $400,000 per unit. However, when you look at the HHH funded projects, there's a different relationship. And actually, as a brief caveat, I want to note that HHH funded projects are everywhere more expensive, regardless of size, and I think that's important to note, and it's also an important avenue for future research, so that the, the issues I'm dealing with today are not sufficient to explain all the higher costs associated with HHH. Um, they're sufficient to partially explain them, but there's, there are other uh, issues at play that should be researched. So here, if you look at um, the same sort of relationship, what you see is that aside from this overall higher cost level, a, a similar pattern appears to take hold here as project size increases. However, when you cross the PLA threshold here and look at these projects that are just covered by the PLA, more or less, you see this large discontinuity in costs. And in fact, the per unit cost for these projects on average is higher than the per unit cost for the smallest types of projects, which should exhibit the, the lowest economies of scale. And then you see this decline where it looks like the sort of more typical relationship in the other data set is, is obtaining here, where these projects may, again, have characteristics that make the PLA sort of a less binding factor on them. Um, 
Of course, that's just a, a descriptive uh, approach. And what I'm going to do is put this into a, the framework of a regression model that's going to control for a variety of important aspects of these projects that can drive construction cost differences, including number of stories, and then also groups of projects according to numbers of stories that correspond with, for instance, changes in construction type. Uh, from podium construction to type one, et cetera, and then also correspond with the requirement to pay commercial prevailing wage among projects that aren't covered by the PLA, as well as shares of units of different sizes, for instance, studio, one bedroom, two bedroom, et cetera, shares of supportive housing units, the presence of elevators and significant parking structures, which uh, under LIHTC allow for different uh, basis uh, costs and then indicators for the target population types, which may also influence characteristics of the building and therefore costs. And what I'm essentially doing is estimating any remaining discontinuity in construction costs at 65 units for HHH projects, which were affected by the PLA, but also allowing there to be a similar discontinuity among non-HHH funded projects. And the basic idea of this model is to take the difference in these two discontinuities after controlling for these other factors. And that's what, I'm going to present is the estimated cost of the PLA. So the results of this model, um, first, I, uh, the, in the main results that I sort of focus on, I use uh, a, a simple outcome as construction costs and thousands of dollars. And I estimate that the PLA increased cost on covered projects between about $43,000 and $47,000 per unit, or about 14 to 16% of, cost, of uh, construction costs. Um, using another commonly used outcome measure uh, in past research on PLAs and a lot of other construction related topics, which is to take the natural logarithm of construction costs. And the reason this is done is that it allows approximately a percent difference interpretation of the resulting estimates. The estimated effect of the PLA is around 20% or closer to $60,000 per unit. This model, I'll note, has very high explanatory power, which is to say that the factors that I include in the model do a really uh, good job of explaining the, the total variation in construction costs um, across a number of different ways of specifying the model. It explains about 65 to 80% of the variation in construction costs. Um, and it's also, uh, these, these estimates don't change much at all when you do a lot of different things, such as excluding outlier data points according to project size and using a lot of like a more flexible approach to estimating these sorts of slopes in the data and so on. Um, so what I do next in order to get at a key policy question, which is how did the PLA potentially affect the unit goal of HHH, is to do a simulation exercise that combines these two uh, pieces of evidence I've just showed you. And what it amounts to is that uh, first I use this regression model to estimate the construction cost of projects that were covered by the PLA in the absence of the PLA. In other words, the model, because of its predictive power, allows you to essentially turn off the effect of the PLA and generate a predicted construction cost without it. This cost is then added back into the other actual cost, main cost, soft cost for each project to create a data set where it's all the projects in HHH with a predicted cost absent the PLA. And then using this sample and a set of counterfactual shares of projects that use the non-HHH sample in terms of the distribution of project size to look at that middle area that I highlighted earlier and basically reallocate the number of projects of different sizes that might have obtained if uh, HHH was a similar funding mechanism to others used in the city's pipeline. What I do is take these counterfactual shares of projects and then randomly draw the appropriate number of projects from this pool of projects with the, the sort of uh, no PLA construction cost in it, create a new sample that was, and first I test this by seeing how well it recreates the original actual sample. And that's presented in the, the research and it does quite a good job. So then I generate these counterfactual samples and do this a thousand times and then basically take the mean value of the total number of housing units predicted, the average per unit cost and the total cost savings. And I'll give you the a, a synopsis of the results of this exercise. So what it indicates is that in the absence of the PLA, around 700 more units of housing would have been produced, which is around 10% more than the almost than the uh, existing pipeline. 
if developers had simply proposed a slate of projects that were distributed similarly to the projects in the non-HHH funded pipeline. Uh, but additionally, this, the simulation indicates that building these approximately 8,000 units could have been done uh, at a cost around $68 million lower than the estimated cost of building the actual 7,300 units in the pipeline. And so then to sort of put this all in housing unit terms, what I do is convert this $68 million into additional housing units at the average cost indicated by uh, the results with the PLA sort of turned off. And then together, this, this generates around another 120 housing units. And then together, the, these uh, two approaches suggest that the PLA cost around 800 housing units as a way of uh, effect, considering how it affected the unit goal of, of HHH. Um, so really quickly, I just have one other main thing to touch on, which is the question of how the targeted hiring provisions uh, tend to work in PLAs. Um, this is relevant because it was the professed uh, motivation of the city council in, in implementing the PLA. Um, the inclusion of these hiring goals, as I mentioned, has grown quite common, but uh, I'm aware of any, I'm unaware of any that lack an explicit enforcement mechanism, though I may uh, not be well informed on this count. Um, I, in searching for evidence on how PLAs do in meeting these goals, there wasn't a lot of it. I found three studies. Uh, covering around nine PLAs and four non-PLA targeted hiring programs that had sort of comparable and complete outcome measures in terms of how they met their goals. These, uh, this sparse evidence suggested that around 33% of documented targeted hiring goals were met under the PLAs while around 50% were met under non-PLA targeted hiring programs, though I wouldn't necessarily make much of this difference uh, because of the sparseness of the evidence. But I'll note, um, importantly, that I'm unaware of any evidence that can credibly compare the levels of hiring under targeted hiring programs, regardless whether PLAs or other non-PLA targeted hiring programs with non-PLA settings. That is to say, there is really no meaningful evidence uh, on the status quo level of hiring of disadvantaged or targeted uh, workers. So this is an important area, I think, for future research. Um, I'm gonna skip these conclusions in the interest of keeping roughly on schedule and just focus on what, the, the only thing I think is a really reasonable policy recommendation uh, because essentially what this work points out is that there are costs and benefits I think to having policies such as PLA attached to uh, housing funding initiatives such as HHH. So I think the important thing to me that, uh, that arises from this analysis that these kind of policies should probably be clearly included in the formulation of a program because they do appear to have costs, for instance, relative to the unit goal of a program like HHH, and that these trade-offs should be debated transparently uh, along with the, the overall policy rather than having these kinds of substantial regulations potentially be added after the fact. And then uh, before I close, I just want to touch on a couple of research questions that I think may help uh, foster the dialogue here and that I would hope to learn more about in the future. Chief among these is what motivated the developers to avoid the PLA, the developer community here. Uh, and, you know, and to my mind, I'm wondering whether it's, it was an accurate understanding of the costs and benefits of a PLA or rather was it a lack of knowledge and potentially concern over uncertainty and how that might affect project costs and timelines, or maybe there were other factors altogether. Second, I have become curious about whether a higher unit threshold, say the 75 unit threshold that was proposed by the developer community in negotiations with the city, or even potentially a higher one might have achieved more union labor utilization by leading to larger projects, which would be more likely to, here I sort of air quote, naturally employ union subs through, for instance, uh, changes in construction type. I think that would be a really important um, aspect to, to think hard about and potentially do some research on. And then finally, uh, it's worth asking whether the use of existing approaches to targeted hiring, such as the city's own existing ordinance, or for instance, the enforceable ordinance used for publicly funded projects in Pasadena, could have met the city council's professed hiring goals without affecting the unit goal of HHH as they uh, had hoped when they passed it. And uh, that's basically the speediest version of this research I can present. Um, I thanks. Thank you for your attention and feedback, and I'm looking forward to the discussion. Um, Let me see if I can get out of this. There we go. 
Well, thank you, Jason. A uh, very um, concise um, uh, report on what you've done and what your findings are. Um, so this now leads us to a panel discussion of about 35 to 45 minutes. And after that, um, we have a uh, Q&A session um, for our audience um, as well. So um, to kick off the panel discussion, I want to welcome Dave and Chris again um, to the panel. Um, and Alan already introduced uh, all of us, so I'm not going to repeat it. I do want to start by um, sharing a, and if I'm repeating myself to you, then I apologize, but some basic understanding about what the, uh, you know, where PLA is in the realm of these labor, um, labor talks. So first, there is a concept called skilled and trained labor. Um, if you're using skilled and trained labor in your project, you're pretty much using almost 100% union labor. So that's the simplest way to explain it. Um, if you're using a PLA, PL, in a PLA, you could have a mix of union and non-union union contractors using agreed upon pools of union and key core workers um, who are not union, um, like who did not believe, belong in unions. The last part is prevailing wage, um, which I think most of us in the, uh, you know, in, in this uh, discussion is familiar with. Prevailing wage contracts could be entirely on non-union. Um, but the hourly compensation of the workers are very similar to the union uh, wage scales. And of course, um, there is a difference between residential prevailing wage rates and commercial prevailing wage wa rate weights. Residential rates are, are, are slightly um, lower and they apply to projects that are four stories or below and commercial prevailing wage rates apply to projects that are five stories and above. So those are the basic understanding, just to make sure that we're all on the same page. The second thing I want to um, emphasize in terms of the purpose and the focus of the discussion is that we are here to find solutions. Um, whether you agree with the findings that Jason has presented or not, um, I think that we can do better in terms of being more cost effective in our construction work. Um, so the focus is on seeking solutions and seeking what next steps we can, um, we can uh, proceed, um, what next steps we can move forward. And uh, keep in mind that we want our cake and eat it too. We want to seek both and solutions. That is having cost-effective construction and paying union level wages. Um, with that in mind, um, we have talked about covering like um, six uh, general topics. And the first questions, first question I want to um, ask uh, Chris and Dave to respond to. And because of the time involved, I'm gonna ask um, ask uh, the the respondents to keep their uh, comments to two to three minutes, except for Chris in this first question, because he asked to, uh, to for a five minute uh, uh, response. So the first question for the two of you, Dave and Chris, is can you address the findings that PLA contracts are more expensive than prevailing wage contracts for our typical affordable housing construction projects? And why do you think that's the case? So Chris, um, I'm gonna ask, uh, that you start with your five minutes and Dave, and I'd like you to uh, follow up and, you know, give us your experience. Chris. Sure, sure. Thank, thank you, Joan. Chris Hannon from Los Angeles, Orange County's Building Construction Trades Council. Uh, the, the RAND report had some interesting, um, interesting uh, models, and I think that Jason was correct, and you would have to ask the development community, you know, what what drove them to build what size projects and if there was a reluctance to the PLA you know what why the reluctance to the PLA but as far as the PLA costing more than non-PLA projects uh, as it relates to Triple H and remember we have to compare apples to apples and oranges to oranges 
So on page 48, uh, there were two projects identified with over 95 units uh, that had um, that had did not have the PLA applied to them. I believe they were uh, in the pipeline before the 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 requirement for the project labor agreement. There, there's two sets when, when we when we analyze the report, you know, from the California Debt Limit Allocation Committee. We could also draw numbers from the Bureau of Contract Administration. When we drew the numbers from the Bureau of Contract Administration, and these numbers closer represent the actual construction costs because they were closer to the actual start of construction uh, when, when contracts, uh, when estimates were in, uh, the, the cost of the PLA projects did not show any increase to the non-PLA projects. The non-PLA projects uh, that were listed there were two of them. They they averaged five hundred and five thousand dollars plus per unit, and the the non PLI projects of the same size, ninety five units or more. There were nine projects that we were able to pull that had the PLA on them. They averaged four hundred and ninety five thousand dollars per unit. Uh, we we could not replicate um, we could not replicate the outcomes in the RAND uh, report. And, um, you know, I, I would, um, I think that uh, Jason uh, or, or Mr. Ward would be, would welcome uh, feedback on the, the numbers and a deeper analysis of the numbers. And, um, you know, we would, at least at the Building Trades, appreciate a retraction on the PLA projects costing more, at least until you ha had a chance to deeper analyze the numbers, and we would love to to sit down with you and, and understand what the difference in numbers are. You know, we're seeing five hundred and five thousand a unit on the projects identified without the PLA uh, above ninety five units that are triple H. Remember, comparing apples to apples, oranges to oranges. PLA projects above ninety five units, nine of them, four hundred ninety five thousand dollars per unit. Um, so, we we could not when when we pulled out the other modeling we couldn't replicate the the above 65 unit uh, with the project labor agreement either and love to sit down uh, with you Jason uh, along with uh, some economists uh, that we use and try to better understand your report maybe you could better understand our outlook on it uh, the prevailing wage rate the rates contained in the project labor agreement are both the same, they're both prevailing wage rate. There's no increases beyond prevailing wage. We have ample supplies of local workers. And then on the, on the, on the suggestion that maybe the city of Los Angeles could have accomplished local hiring goals without a project labor agreement. In our view, uh, policies, we're familiar with the policy in Pasadena. We've analyzed some of the projects uh, and the, it, it's just not achievable without the project labor agreement. You need a, a formal uh, pool of skilled labor that's large enough, that has enough intake to bring local community into apprenticeship programs to learn these highly skilled jobs, to actually achieve a local hire. And we need the provisions within the project labor agreement to do the preferred hiring for the local residents. So that, that'll conclude my, my remarks on uh, analyzing, you know, the outcome of the report. Uh, other parts of the report I think are interesting and you have to ask the developers for that. Well, thank you, Chris. Um, Jason's report, I think Jeanette already uh, posted the, the link in chat. So if you're interested in taking a look at it, um, it, it uh, please go there. And Chris also mentioned that uh, um, the building trades have done some um, independent uh, um, research and analysis, and uh, we would welcome um, Chris for you to post it online somewhere. Um, we can talk about it um, afterwards. Um, so, but Dave, love to hear your um, your experience in terms of uh, you know. Um, uh, PLA contracts and uh, prevailing wage contracts. Um, any difference in costs, and why do you think um, there's a difference? 
uh, Dave, uh, unmute, please. Sorry about that. Um, you think I would have uh, gotten the hang of that over the last year and a half. Um, <laughs> but uh, in any respect, uh, uh, we, we at EAH haven't had the opportunity to work with the Los Angeles uh, PLA. Our projects that we started in 2016 and going through today have been uh, around 50 units. Uh, and our, our, our sizing of the project really had nothing to do whether it was PLA or not. It just happened to be site constraints and funding driven. So from that perspective, um, you know, I just need to make that known. But however, you know, anecdotally, uh, after discussions with some of our contractor uh, colleagues up uh, in Northern California and in Southern California, um, the, the information referenced in the uh, RAND report anecdotally sounds logical. It may not prove itself out given Chris's uh, research, but it anecdotally it does because it's not a function necessarily of prevailing wage uh, so much as it is all the additional compliance and trainings and other things that go in with the PLA that that aren't usually uh, required in a, in a regular prevailing wage, non-union, non-PLA setting. And so those all things, all those things come into play uh, to add costs. So I, I think it, you know, it, to say availability of, of labor and, and, and prevailing wage really isn't the question so much as it is the availability of qualified general contractors and subcontractors that are willing to go into that space. And we're concerned about the cost impacts of, of going into a project that might be triggered, might, might trigger prevailing wage under the PLA or trigger the PLA um, and not knowing or experiencing exactly what that impact is. Uh, we, we know that our colleagues uh, have repeatedly told us that there is a, you know, a large impact um, in both in terms of potential schedule risk, not necessarily they've, they've lived the schedule risk, but also the, the cost impacts because $43,000 a unit is, is a lot of money when you consider you're talking about a, a 50 unit project or 60 unit project. And when you get into bigger projects, it's significantly more. But I think from, from our standpoint, um, it's, it's the costs are, are logical. They're influenced by more than just prevailing wage. Uh, and it is a concern to ours. Certainly, we, we also support and have in other jurisdictions uh, local hire provisions, uh, both for uh, small and medium-sized building uh, contractors, but also minority-owned and women-owned, uh, which are really elements that are important to our mission at EAH. So it's a combination of a lot of things that, that go into that. So we don't object to uh, making available uh, small businesses and minority-owned businesses into the, the mix. We think it's great. We just need to find a mechanism for making that happen efficiently so that we have efficient um, uh, pricing and, and bidding process throughout the spectrum of, of our, of our uh, schedule of values. Dave, thank you so much because this, your, your comment is a perfect segue to question number two. two. Um, question number two, two is, um, the pool of contractors and subcontractors working with prevailing wage is small. It is even smaller for those willing to work with PLAs. How can we expand that pool? Um, so I'm going to reverse the order, um, the order, have Dave respond first and then Chris. And um, so from, from, from here on out, I'm going to ask you guys to keep your response to two to three minutes um, at each. Great. Now I'll just uh, continue on with uh, my, my thought on the previous question is uh, that, um, you know, we, we agree that, that, uh, you know, prevailing wage and uh, needs to be paid on all of our, most of all of all of our funding sources. So that's really not the, the issue. 
We do think though that there probably aren't enough uh, union general contractors and subcontractors to fully serve the commercial and uh, PLA uh, level uh, size projects because we've got, we work with a variety of different contractors, not many of which are union signatories right now in Los Angeles. Uh, and how to bring them into uh, a PLA setting that doesn't upset the apple cart and causes them to back out. We're concerned that, uh, that uh, you know, in a PLA setting um, that some of these contractors that we've worked with in the past and are currently working with might not feel comfortable going into that setting uh, and, and all the requirements to go in with the, the PLA, the 74 or 5 page document that's the PLA uh, and and get their heads wrapped around it. And so we're concerned that that's going to limit the pool of qualified contractors that work in specifically in the affordable multifamily housing marketplace. Thank you. Um, Chris. Thank you, John. Thank you, Dave. Um, you know, I, I think a way to increase the, the number of contractors that are willing to work on prevailing wage, affordable housing projects is to uh, create more uh, prevailing wage, affordable housing projects. Mm -hmm. uh, if, there's, if there's a limited amount of affordable housing projects that have prevailing wage requirements in the area, and, uh, you know, there, there's getting to be more and more, but the need for the area is substantially more you know, you're, you're naturally going to have more contractors. Uh, and uh, I have a, a vast amount of experience on the union side. I've been a member uh, for 26 years and actually worked for my local union and now the Building Trades Council for a total of 15 years combined. There's plenty of union contractors that are willing to bid all types of work, including affordable housing, if there's a sufficient amount of work in the area. So if we have a small amount of projects, you're not gonna have a huge contractor base to select from, they're gonna go where the work is. And um, I think, you know, we, we've shown a, that we're committed to the partnership with SCAMF to expand affordable housing opportunities, to expand funding streams for affordable housing. And uh, we, we support the need for affordable housing uh, we just want to make sure that you know the opportunities to work on those projects are the best careers possible and the PLA for us gets does is that vehicle for us. So in 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 uh, in the spirit of um, seeking solutions, um, Chris has offered to give um, SCAMP a list of all the contractors um, that uh, are capable of doing the uh, the work that we need done. Um, and this would be, I think that this is, this is focused on Orange County and uh, Los Angeles County. Um, so we look forward to getting that list and uh, working with our contractors to um, expand the, uh, um, and reach out and expand the pool um, of um, subcontractors and contractors who may be willing to, um, um, to jump in and participate in the multifamily affordable housing um, construction area. Um, question number three, um, union shops, uh, both for GCs and for subs are usually very large and they're not really interested in bidding on the typical affordable housing jobs. Um, how can we entice these shops to bid and how can we help create more competition that is create more union shops. Um, I, I'm going to read Chris and then and the, and then Dave um, and uh, um, and if Jason, if you have something to say, um, I'm going to ask you to say it at the end of their comment. Um, Chris. Yeah, I, I think it's a misnomer that uh, that union shops are large contractors. Yeah, there's there's plenty of large contractors that are union shops. But there's also a tremendous amount of family-owned businesses that have 10 employees 
and draw from uh, draw from the Union Hall on a regular basis when they get additional work. Um, I think the one thing in context of affordable housing projects and housing projects in general is it's really not a public bidding process. You have a bidding process that's limited to your network, you know, whether it's your known network or somebody else that learns of your network and that, that network is, is your universe of contractors. So it's, it's much different than, a, than a, you know, as described earlier in the report, the process for bidding a school project that has a very public and transparent bidding process. Uh, so I think that, uh, you know, picking backing on, the, on the, my comments earlier, the more projects to bid, the more interest in bidding those projects. And I think as we all know that the need for affordable housing is great, as we get more affordable housing projects in the pipeline, more contractors will be interested in bidding those projects. Um, you know, there's, there's, there's things that in the relationship between the developer and the general contractor and the general contractor's relationship with their subs that can make it more enticing for contractors to bid. And um, I think that those are, you know, just uh, honest uh, business and, and long-term relationships, I think that you you develop uh, practices and experience and how to entice subcontractors to, to bid. But the first seven years of my career, I worked for a union shop that had between six and 14 employees in the field. So I've seen both sides and I've also worked for a large shop as well. Thank, well, thank you. you. Um, Dave? Yeah, um, you know, I, I'll leave uh, um, increasing the number of union uh, contractors to Chris's capable hands. Uh, my, my focus is really on providing uh, uh, affordable housing for all classes of people wherever we develop. Uh, and at, uh, at a cost-effective, uh, reasonable uh, uh, dollar number. Um, and uh, that number has been creeping up for a variety of reasons uh, and uh, largely due to regulations, uh, compliance issues, uh, and a PLA just adds another layer of that, that compliance that uh, creates uh, additional cost not so much again on the labor side of things, but on the compliance side of things uh, specifically, and which limits the, we think the uh, the number of qualified bidders in our in our space uh, uh, that, that we call affordable housing. Uh, you know, I I think one of the things that uh, we really want to focus on is how do we how do we achieve the end goal together. Uh, you know, we're not we're not for or against, but we're very skeptical that uh, a PLA is the right way to go on on affordable housing projects. We may be proven wrong in the future. If we are, we are. Uh, but we want to be able to to build our our projects and house people that need to be housed uh, as quickly and as efficiently as we can. And if we don't have the the, the labor pool. Or the subcontractor pool uh, in the short term that affects our short-term deliveries. And so, while Chris is talking about long-term relationship building, absolutely, I'm all for that. But in the short term, where we foresee a, a project until a problem uh, needs uh, a solution and workarounds need to be um, need to be. Uh, worked on and, and brought to the fore so that we don't get ourselves in a bind where we can't get out of it and we're forced to pay higher than what we're uh, mandated to, to pay. We have certain limits uh, that the TCAC or LITEC will, will allow in the state of California. So we need to be mindful of that at all times. So um, yeah, that's sort of the brief, brief explanation. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, Jason, very quickly, any um, any insight during your interviews with uh, contractors and developers? Um, did you come across um, the concern about uh, not having enough um, subcontractors and contractors interested in working on uh, multifamily affordable housing PLAs? 
Um, yeah, so I would say, you know, briefly, like any observations I have are probably going to pale in terms of expertise to what you all can bring to bear. But, um, but to your point, Joan, you know, in, in some sort of uh, candid conversations with developers, I, I have heard on uh, more than one occasion that there's there's often a concern as to, you know, because I think the, the perception among developers, at least, is that union contractors and union subs are, are have a lot of work available to them. And so that when it comes to say building a you know four story, sixty unit housing project, seventy unit housing project, or whatever the case may be, there's a concern whether you know something better might come along where it says you know oh this is twice as much work and it's going to last twice as long so maybe we'll not you know we won't be able to get to this or we won't have the full number of people available that we thought we might or whatever and so you know I obviously can't speak to the veracity of those claims but I think that was a concern that was expressed to me that. That essentially when you restrict the labor pool, you know, from an economics perspective, I think the PLAs and similar skilled and trained requirements essentially restrict the labor pool to a much smaller subsection of all the potential people who can work on a project. And so I think developers ha have clearly expressed to me in conversation that there's just a concern that that restricted labor pool has a lot of opportunities that, that they can be deployed to work on and that uh, there's a concern that these projects, as Dave sort of alluded to, are kind of small peanuts and that may result in say drawn out timelines if the labor supply is smaller than what was expected and so forth. Okay, anecdotal information, but um, important perception at least by developers um, that, uh, you know, as we move forward, um, this is one area that we need to, you know, look at solutions. Um, Jason, you already suggested some solutions, um, policy solutions at the end of your presentation. And hopefully, you know, this panel conversation would uh, also um, unearth some um, uh, research and, and next steps that we could uh, pursue. Um, the next question, I have been um, uh, told that by a number of uh, contractors and developers that open shops that do pay minimum wage and are trying to do PLAs find that union hall hires can be problematic because there's no ongoing employer employee employee relationship and um, that uh, these these hires could slow walk a job that would lead to um, delays and cost increases. Um, how would you address that? Are there any solutions? Um, Chris, I'm going to start with you and then go to Dave. Sure, sure. I, I mean, anybody can come up with any scenario, but the practical application of the project labor agreement in the hiring hall, if, uh, if a union member is sent out to a contractor open shop or union shop and the, the in union member doesn't perform to their expectations, they simply send them back to the union hall and request a replacement. Okay. We have over 130 project labor agreements in the area. So this is happening on a daily basis. It isn't like, hey, there's these, these three projects where we have open shop contractors working, pulling uh, hall hire union members out of the union hall. It's happening on over 100 projects. and those 130 project labor agreements, some of those cover multiple project build programs like Triple H, where there's a number of projects on there. So, you know, anything can happen, but the real mechanics of the PLA, if someone's not happy with a worker for whatever reason, uh, as long as it's not discriminating against any protected classes, um, you know, for, you know, uh, I can go into those, but as long as it's not discrimination, uh, they send them back to the union hall and just request a replacement. Good to know. Um, Dave, what's your experience? Uh, well, I guess, you know, I'm not a contractor, so I, maybe I, I'm not as qualified on this line item as this question as, uh, as Chris and, and others might be. But from, from my standpoint, um, it's not so much the skilled and trained, but we want to make sure that they actually have experience. So the people in the labor hall, halls that, that are called upon need to have that experience. And our subcontractors are gonna rely on that. And ultimately we're gonna rely on the general contractor to make it happen. So there needs to be a sort of a bottom up, top down kind of relationship um, on, on how that's handled. And maybe, you know, Chris can be hands-on when that issue becomes available. 
or becomes a, a, a topic of discussion um, to try and solve. But uh, I, I have had uh, similar experience uh, in a prior life uh, doing a, a PLA project in the Bay Area where we had such a discussion with the, the Building Trades Council in San Mateo County. And it was a big discussion. And, and uh, you know, I heard more than once or twice that, well, that's really not uh, for us to do. That's that take care of. That's for your subcontractor and and your subcontractor to 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 find a solution and, and hire somebody else. Well, while he's trying to hire somebody else, he's not doing the job he's been being uh, paid to do and potentially uh, risking the schedule overall schedule uh, of, of our project. And that's essentially what happened. And San Mateo County some years ago, um, but we haven't, you know, like I said, we don't have any real life LA experience. So, uh, you know, that's a concern of ours is that there is no real recourse other than to go back to the hall and get somebody else. And we're not certain that that somebody else is gonna be uh, at an experience level that's gonna benefit the subs or the general contractor when they're brought onto the site. So that's a, that's a concern. Thank you. Uh, Chris? Respond real briefly. Yeah. Sure. So the the union halls uh, predominantly are, are filled with graduates of uh, joint labor management apprenticeship programs, which are considered the gold standard for apprenticeship. Here locally in Los Angeles and Orange County, we have over 21,000 apprentices that live in LA and Orange County through these union apprenticeship programs. So we have a healthy pipeline of of highly skilled uh, workers gaining more experience. And when you request a journey level that's graduated from one of those programs, um, you know, the, the, the Los Angeles, Orange Counties Council and our affiliates, we have plenty of highly skilled members that are building all types of projects. So I'm sure your, your subcontractors down here would get the best trained uh, workforce anywhere around. Well, thank you. Um, moving on, on the state level in Sacramento, there seems to be a, this, um, this tussle about whether skilled and trained labor should be, language should be included in a number of affordable housing and land use bills. Um, coming down to the local level, that is Chris, um, in the Orange County and LA um, County level where um, you are the leader, um, do you prefer skilled and trained labor or PLAs for your members? And um, if you are in willing to accept a blanket PLA for let's say um, Los Angeles County, would you be willing to negotiate um, volume thresholds and the uh, waivers um, due to you know, limited uh, bidders? I'm not authorized to speak statewide. I can speak about Los Angeles and Orange County. Sure. And I think in uh, in Mr. Ward's report, you know, identified a possible benefit to having the requirements in the in the initial initiative. So within the within the findings of best practices in the report, it identified having it already in in the process. So you know. Our project labor agreements, our members are, are skilled and trained and meet the skilled and trained requirements. So they're really one in the same for us. And um, you know, I'm, I'm really only authorized to speak for Los Angeles and Orange Counties. And um, you know. Okay, well, great. Um, the last question is um, for the panel is, um, uh, what is the outlook of labor capacity um, in the union halls? Um, if Southern California steps up in terms of, uh, you know, affordable housing production by 3,000 extra units a year or even 10,000 units a year, which means that we need, you know, thousands upon thousands of additional construction workers, um, where will we recruit these workers? And how long would it take them to get fully trained to be productive and contributing to the affordable housing field? Um, 
And uh, related to that, Chris, is uh, what is an acceptable percentage of apprentices on the job? So Chris, you want to start? That, sure, that's a very, very good question. Uh, here in Los Angeles, Orange Counties, we have about 150,000 plus of the best trained men and women in construction uh, working in, in both counties at any one given time. Statewide, those numbers are about 480,000. Out of those 150,000, we have 21,000 plus local apprentices in joint labor management union sponsored programs. And you have to remember we're, we're bringing in enough apprentices and enough journey level members to, to man the work. You know, we, we, we work for our members and, it, you know, we're, we're not asking people to join the union to flood the market with, with skilled construction workers sitting around with no work. So we bring in enough apprentices to, to, to fulfill all the calls for work. So if we had enough work for 27,000 apprentices, we would have 27,000 apprentices. If we had enough for 30,000, we will most certainly would have 30,000. Most of our apprenticeship schools right now are utilized either in the evening or during the day. Uh, some do both, but uh, we can add additional capacity uh, within our apprenticeship system here. Um, you know, very quickly, we already have screened uh, vetted candidates waiting to come into the programs for our local residents. We have uh, pre-apprenticeship programs where we're doing outreach into, uh, into different communities to make sure that we're reaching out to underserved communities. We're tr desperately trying to increase our numbers uh, and trying to message that it's not just a good career for a man, it's a great career for, uh, for female members as well. And through our MC3 apprenticeship readiness programs, you know, we're reaching out all throughout both counties and we have thousands of screened applicants prepared and ready to enter that first level of apprenticeship already. And we're just waiting for more opportunities to show you what we can build. Um, want to hold you to, uh, to the last bit of my question, which is um, what is an acceptable percentage of apprentices on the job for PLA? So prevailing wage uh, requires, for the most part, for every five journey level hours, we use one apprentice hour. Mm -hmm. And some of the trades can go up as high as one to one. So not all trades, but it depends on their apprenticeship standards. But the minimum uh, across the board, uh, with, without an exception for a non-apprenticeable craft, is for every five journey level hours, one apprentice hour. And then some of those trades go up to a maximum of one to one, so 50%. Thank you. Um, Dave, any comments about the you know, um, labor availability? We've touched on it, you've touched on it already, but uh, you know, uh, any other thoughts? Well, I mean, uh, yes, I do. I think I'd like to go back to the last question about a statewide uh, PLA or, or uh, uh, or uh, skilled and trained. I, I think from from EH perspective, uh, we would not want to see that to be statewide. We think there's enough difference between the different geographies and jurisdictions throughout the state that um, that would unnecessarily uh, restrict development of affordable housing. I'm not saying it does in LA. I'm just saying it a statewide different uh, economics play into account in, in certain regions. Uh, so I wouldn't, I don't think we would be in favor of a, of a global standard uh, in that direction. Uh, but for labor, um, yeah, we, you know, we've noticed in, you know, in the end of the reception that uh, a lot of subcontractors and tradesmen left the, left the, the field because of the poor economy. And so now everybody's trying to build up both in the, the union area, but also in the non-union area, build up um, their, their labor pool and their, their, their trade so that they can, uh, so the general contractors can bid jobs with them. Uh, and that's been a struggle in the Bay Area, especially. Uh, and I'm sure it's been a struggle down in the Southern California region as well. Uh, you know, we've, so, um, 
you know, we would have a, we would need to have some sort of off ramp or, or some sort of waiver, as you mentioned earlier, uh, Joan, uh, on, on how to bridge that gap from today to when there's when when all of our general contractors are 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 more comfortable with the PLA setting. Right now, they're not. I mean, frankly, they're not uh, the ones we work with and we like working with. Uh, but that may change in the future. Uh, so there needs to be some sort of a transition mechanism or a group of transition mechanisms that should a, a project be subjected to a PLA that, that might safeguard uh, you know, a reasonable cost. And that might involve uh, uh, special dispensations for, for small and local businesses that might require uh, an exemption for modular factory housing because uh, that uh, that's a construction technique that's being used widely and we're venturing into that field right now on a, on a couple of projects. Um, the uh, exempt rehab uh, projects we, which we haven't really talked about we've been mo mostly focusing on new construction HHH funds um, and then uh, you know talking about you know exempting certain levels of core employees of both the general contractor and the the subcontractor from uh, uh, you know, PLA activity. And that doesn't mean everybody, that just means the core employees that run those companies. Uh, and then we wanna make sure that there's some sort of a rule of three, if you will, where we have at least three bidders on all levels of the, the project so that we, we can have an understanding that it's been bid, it's been bid by qualified people, uh, groups, and that the pricing that we're getting is reasonable. Um, so, and we've had some challenges getting that. Uh, and we've had uh, discussions with contractors that are union shop contractors uh, for, and other developers who are working on, on PLA projects uh, in Northern California that uh, say it's, it's tough to get that. Now we were able to work that out in the PLA in Alameda County, uh, but not all the trades signed up for it. Everybody but but one trade signed up for the rule of three, if you will. Um, and I don't know what the what the feeling is in Chris and the the LA Orange County uh, region about about that. But there okay. needs to be sort of an off ramp. Yeah, very very helpful. This is certainly um, you know a lot of food for thoughts. It is now three forty three. Um, I what I propose that we go to the uh, audience Q and A, uh, and before we uh, wrap everything up, that we would ask each of you to um, to have a minute to say whatever concluding remarks that you want to uh, you want to provide to to each other and to the audience. So, Alan, um, you're going to um, uh, present the questions. Then I can do that. Yeah, we've had a, a number of. of uh comments and a number of questions i'm sure I'm not going to be able to get all the way through them i'm going to do my best to um kind of take these in the order that they came in um so the first one i, th I think actually jason this might um might be for you but i think uh both chris and, and dave have some thoughts about it too but it comes from all right at the uh architects association um, talking about uh, per unit cost in particular, uh, asking if there's also a record of how much per unit cost of housing labor was paid. So the idea of sort of um, understanding leak, linkage, leakage, um, so controlling for, you know, administering costs of the program that didn't directly benefit labor. So was there any work, any data in your work that talked about how much specifically was going to the workers? Uh, so do you mean, um, so like the labor bill versus say building materials and all Correct. sorts of things? Right, I, I'm not aware of any great data on that. I would love to get some, um, but uh, you know, again, Chris and Dave may know more about this. My impression is that that would have to be collected from say individual contractors or developers or something. Dave and Chris, any comments? Uh, yeah, we, we don't track that either, and you know, we'd have to go directly to the we'd have to go directly to the subcontractors and and work on that. Um, but um, we could definitely look at a couple of projects we're working on now and see what we can find. 
The best data we have is, is on average, this type of project, uh, about 15% of the total cost of the project is labor. And that's that's money going directly to the workers. That's not yeah. That's actually that's that. actually for wages and benefits. Uh, you know, not including equipment, uh, architect, uh, engineering. Uh, you know, insurance, carry cost, uh, land cost. About fifteen percent labor. You mean fifteen one five percent of total development cost is in labor? Yes. Inclu that so the denominator includes like land cost, architecture and engineering permits and fees. Yeah, your, your total development cost for a project, about 15% in this region uh, with, with land cost, what they are, about 15% of the project cost is labor. I've and, also heard very roughly that for the construction contract itself, the construction contract itself, that it is about, for new construction, it's about 50% materials and 50% labor. You, you got to remember that there's significant cost in material when you're building something su substantial. Also, within that construction cost, you have uh, you have engineering, you have equipment cost. Mm -hmm. so, you know that material you're using. You're also using equipment to you know to facilitate that. Mm -hmm. Labor cost about fifteen percent. Okay. Thank you, Alan. Uh, yeah, uh, another another architect, Brian Lane, um, kind of weighs in on the question that got brought up in, during the discussion around uh, residential prevailing wage rates versus commercial prevailing wage rates. Um, and I'm paraphrasing a little bit, but the, the, the question is what's to be done about that transition from residential to commercial prevailing wage rates when you get to bigger buildings? And is there an opportunity to uh, diminish the impact on the increased cost on the labor side so that we can do more density and take advantage of some of the state policies and the local policies that allow for, for density in certain places. So um, who wants it? Uh, Chris, do you, do you want to take this? I'll give somebody else the opportunity to answer it first. If no one wants it, I'll take it. Why don't you take it first and I'll follow up if uh, I hear something that I need to comment on. Your prevailing wage rates apply equally, you know, regardless of a project labor agreement. So if you're talking about an affordable housing project, they're applied equally and uh, they, they simply are, are what they are. You know, when you're building the bigger project that may get into the commercial rates, I think Jason uh, brought up some good factors that economies of scale also lower cost. And remember, labor is only uh, one component of the total cost of the project. So, you know the, you know the factor in you know building a larger project. You know you you're not going to change state prevailing wage requirements. You're building a project that requires them. There is no getting around that. There's no negotiating. It's state law. Yeah, I, I have no objections to that. I think that's that's right. Yeah, and I feel like you know. As, as is the case with many of these questions, they're really just a math problem. Like, you know, at some point you, you add up what it's going to cost and what you think you can raise. Have you done any work on that, about that conversion to sort of bigger, more dense buildings and then absorbing the commercial prevailing wage costs associated with it? Are you asking me? I'm asking you, yeah. Um, no. Okay. Sorry. All right. Um, great. Uh, so... Let's see, here's another question, which is, I think, directed at me, or to you and me, Chris, both, which is, uh, you know, would, would SCAMP be willing to work with the Building Trades Council to train affordable housing developers on best practice, practices on project labor agreements and how to improve their own construction processes? Um, I'll say that actually also laced in here is, uh, I see your predecessors um, in the meeting. And so, hey, hey, Ron Miller, how are you? And you mentioned kind of uh, a number of um, facts from the past when we were working on Triple H, the linkage fee, Triple J, uh, about places where we tried to work together, where we brought developers to the training facilities, where we got a chance to sort of get to know each other better. So I would just say the past is, pre past is precedent for us. We'd be happy to 
at any time sort of learn um, and get to know each other better. So I would welcome that opportunity. Just wonder, Chris, if you have any thoughts about that. We'll, we'll sit down and we'll, we'll schedule a form, whichever is most convenient for everybody and most effective, whether it be uh, here uh, via uh, you know a platform like this or when, when it gets a little safer to do so. If we wanted to meet in person, happy to, to do whatever works uh, best for everybody. Terrific. Um, here's one that says, uh, do PLAs lead to a higher developer fee or potentially a takeaway from, or perhaps has no bearing on developer fee? So I guess the question really is on the labor cost side, does the labor cost, whether it's prevailing wage or a project labor agreement have impact on the developer fee as it relates to um, the calculation for a developer fee on total development? That's a Dave question. Yeah, that, that is a Dave question. It's it really, if you have to bring that uh, to you know, widen that a little bit, if we're just talking about prevailing wage projects, projects that are funded by with prevailing wage requirements in PLA projects, there's no difference between the two. If you're talking about a project that's not subject to prevailing wage, there's a huge discrepancy uh, in, 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 in both cost and a little bit in developer fee, but developer fees are typically capped by, by TCAC, uh, which is our state tax credit allocation committee. So. Uh, everybody that's building, that's a nonprofit that's building affordable housing in the state of California isn't uh, really driven by profit motivation. We get developer fees so we can keep the doors open so we can continue the mission. Thank you. Um, yeah, here's an, another question about the, the three bids, which I think we've touched on. Uh, a question, a comment, thanking everybody for the thoughtful presentations. Um, let's see, bear with me a second. Oh, here's one. Um, so this from uh, uh, Tara Baraskas from the, from the Community Corporation of Santa Monica and also the president of the SCAMP board. Uh, costs are a huge challenge for our industry. Our funding sources limit costs and we often have to lose units to meet cost and funding constraints. What, what suggestions does the group have um, to bring construction costs down to mitigate the potential increases in uh, costs of the PLA, assuming the RAND report data is true? And then for example, could we somehow pool contracts um, that it's so that it's not one one individual deal, but a number of deals uh, operating as kind of a pooling or leveraging buying power of multiple projects. Does anybody have any familiar with that or any thoughts about that as a concept? Well, um, let me let me just take a, a bite at the uh, at the idea of pooling things together. Um, we had the uh, fortune or rather unfortunate. Um, uh, experience of building a, a, a scattered site project. It turned out well, but it was very painful during the construction process where we had three individual uh, sites uh, with that are about a, a quarter to three quarters of a mile apart from one another. Um, <clears throat> and that was challenging for a general contractor. If you're talking about pooling different ownership entities and different project types into a single contract, that would be horrendously difficult and I think uh, administratively a mess. So you might want to avoid that. As far as uh, how do you reduce costs? I, I don't think it's just reducing costs. I think you need to make the policymakers aware that should they require more constraints on, on, on their funding programs, they need to be aware that there's some cost impact or so, some cost impl uh, implications to it, uh, as well as uh, figuring out, uh, you know, how we work within a framework of these projects, and that goes to how we entitle projects and what, how much CEQA and other kind of environmental timeframes during the entitlements 
and the design guidelines that we're, have, we're constrained with in certain jurisdictions drive the cost. So the more, more basic and more state streamlined entitlement process, that would help. Uh, and certainly just some recognition at the state level on their programs that costs uh, and, and regulations have in cost impacts. And so they have to rec you have to recognize both in, in, in this scenario. It's not just reducing costs. It's not just uh, going in and saying, you know, if you require X, Y, and Z, it's going to cost more money. Uh, and you need to provide more money. So you need to uh, increase your per unit um, uh, caps that you have on these funding sources. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Anybody else on the pooling concept? All right, Joan, I think with allowing for time for the closing statements, I yeah. think we're sort of there. So I'll give it back to you. Yeah, so um, just looking at my screen right now, I'm just going to invite all three of you to um, give a one minute clo closing statement. And I will start with Dave. Well, I'd just like to thank uh, Scamp, Alan, and, and Joan, and, and the rest of the crew uh, on board that set this up. I appreciate it very much. Uh, it was a nice conversation and, and informative one, for, for me at least. Uh, and, and, and Chris, perhaps we'll be chatting one-on-one uh, -on -one in the future. Uh, but, but thank you again. And um, I thought the RAND report I, it made a lot of sense to me. Uh, anecdotally, and um, uh, I enjoyed uh, reading it, and hopefully, will it'll be uh, you know it'll be uh, a source of continued discussion within SCAMP, and and Rand can perhaps maybe update their their report at, at a later uh, period of time with more data. Thank you, um, Jason. You're next on my little <laughs> okay. collection of boxes. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, thanks again for having me to present my research. Um, I just wanted to say a few words around the issues that Chris raised, um, which is that um, in an appendix of the report, I actually deal in, in pretty significant depth with the two projects that he was discussing. I wasn't really super clear on the criticism um, based on the time constraints that we're obviously operating under, but um, that stuff is dealt with. And then secondly, for the report, I, I did make available the code and all the data for this report. Uh, publicly for interested researchers and at least one researcher that uh, is affiliated with uh, Northern California unions. Um, I've had a dialogue with and pointed him to those resources. Um, and then finally, I just wanted to say um, one thing I think maybe wasn't discussed here, and I don't know if it's really could be on the table, but in terms of ways forward, I, th I think that um, something I haven't heard a lot of discussion about is potentially trying to use incentives rather than say restrictions on labor pool that can be used on projects. Like for instance, you know, if it's possible to say, use tax credits or additional density bonuses or other things to incentivize the use of unionized labor, I think that would present developers with, you know, a, a positive return for doing, you know, for using union labor, and also would sort of present a natural off ramp if those incentives weren't strong enough, or if union labor wasn't available. So, you know, it seems like that may not be in the cards, but that's just something I think would be worth taking a, a harder look at as far as potential ways forward to, that can benefit our regional housing needs. Thanks. Thank you. Um, Chris, gonna ask you to wrap up. Sure, sure. Uh, thank you, Joan, for, for mod moderating a, a great panel here. Wanna thank everybody that's uh, joining us here. All the, the great questions that are coming in the chat box. Uh, look forward to Dave possibly sitting down with you in the future. Alan, always great to see you. Uh, Jason, look forward uh, if, if you're open to sitting down and looking at the differences, how we look at the different numbers. And, um, you know, to everybody, the, the Building Trades uh, supports uh, affordable housing, um, but, but not at the expense of the construction worker. The people on the job shouldn't be exploited in the name of affordable housing. I'm not saying that anybody in this group uh, doesn't share that same, uh, that same uh, thought with me. Look forward to collaborating uh, whatever is most convenient for everyone in the future. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, well, um, 
Thank you, everybody, for a very informative and uh, constructive discussion. Um, I think that we are we share very similar values in terms of workers' rights and um, improving the um, our economy and um, making sure that we our workers have a, a, can afford a quality of life that they deserve. So, with that in mind. Um, this is only the beginning of a, um, a, a, a journey that uh, I hope we will continue to work together. So thank you. Turning it over back to you, Alan. I can't cap it any better than that. Thanks everybody for the great conversation and thanks for the 149 people who showed up today. <laughs> See you later.